ho hopefully I won't uh, cause a disaster with the water here. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. All right, so this is a... Uh, I wasn't sure about this, uh, so this was actually going to be the, you know, kind of the uh, the climax of the talk, you know, the secret of the talk, and then I then I decided to 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 go a different route with it, and uh, try and draw some people out with kind of a provocative title, you know, and get get people interested in, in what I'm talking about here. So, um, do we have any musicians here? All right. Do we have any bass players? Yeah, four bass players. See what I mean? We're done. We've we've proved it. So it was at least half. I think uh, at least half of the hands I saw go up uh, were bass players, uh, and I'm a bass player, so I count as well. <clears throat> Which is why why uh, well we'll get there. Okay, so why are we here? Okay, so. You know, this is a culture talk. You know, there's, uh, I'm not going to have any uh, Ida Pro walkthroughs or, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be doing any super sexy hacks or anything like this. It's 6 p.m. on the last day of B-Sides Las Vegas. So uh, I'm going to give you a little brain candy here. Uh, this is going to be a uh, little bit of entertainment. But, you know, I've got some uh, interesting stuff. Uh, you know, it's not all fluff. I've got some uh, statistics for you. And uh, hopefully uh, this is the beginning of something I'm going to do, uh, continually do over time and refine and learn more about. <clears throat> you know, it's for me, uh, I love uh, looking for patterns in things. And I guess that's one of the things that made me a good incident responder, good at forensics, good at uh, a lot of things in security. So uh, as, as with, uh, with many of us, and I think a lot of us have similar stories, and that's really what this is all about. So I'm going to go through some casual observations. This all started out with, with uh, uh, you know, not, not really some hard data with big sample sets. You know, it was really just observations and anecdotal. So I'm going to go through the, some of that, and then I'm going to go through how I found some more concrete stuff, uh, you know, uh, my, my process, how I found this stuff, and uh, I'm going to draw some conclusions about it. And don't expect anything really hard in, the, in, in terms of conclusions. It's still pretty early. Uh, I, I started doing surveys and collecting data after our, uh, this talk was accepted. So uh, we're a couple weeks in, but I, I think we can, we can really do some interesting stuff in the future. So when I started this, I was, I was kind of at a, at a crossroads. And uh, I just really wanted to use this picture because the, uh, the color contrast and it's relaxing and pretty. and uh, I, I think we all need more relaxing and pretty. And uh, in my survey, yeah, that, that really revealed that a lot of my responses, uh, I, I didn't expect the kind of responses I got. They were raw, they were passionate, they were, uh, you know, they really didn't hold back. And a lot of people, uh, I, I made it so that people could be anonymous. You know, some of you, how many people in here, well, <laughs> well, Okay, no, 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 no raising hands. You know, it's 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 kind of beside the point. But if you took the survey, uh, I made it possible for you to be anonymous. But people put their names in there. They put their email addresses in there. They put their phone numbers in there. You know, so I was really surprised at the honesty that I got back. And when I gave somebody uh, a clear field to just type their thoughts into, uh, they typed paragraphs. You know, they didn't they didn't put a couple of comments in there. They didn't put just a sentence in there. You know, uh, I, I got whole paragraphs in there. So I, I get the feeling um, some of these people have never been asked these questions before. You know, it really made them think and, and uh, realize that they, they kind of want to share how they got into security and how they got here. Uh, and I, I found most of the, most of the stories are, are really pretty interesting. Uh, the downside of that is I got such a response from my surveys um, that I've only scratched the surface of the results. I get 144 responses out of 14 questions, which is about 2,500 results to go through. And some of those individual results uh, have as many as eight 
uh, results w within them, you know, because I gave check all that apply, also, you know, write me, you know, write in your answer. You know, so it was really overwhelming what I got. Uh, but I, I, I do have some of it for you today. So I have puzzles and prizes. I, I thought it would, would be fun to, uh, you know, indulge uh, th this part of us that, that I think is pretty common with us. Uh, I've got uh, Rubik's Cube up here. I've got a few blacksmith, uh, old school blacksmith puzzles. If you've never played with one, they're a lot of fun. Uh, so while I'm talking, I invite you to come up here and get some of those. Also, I've got uh, free stickers for anybody that filled out the survey or, well, really anybody that came. You know, I didn't know how many people would be here, but I've, I've got more than enough stickers. And they're uh, these hacker stickers. Uh, uh, a friend of, my, uh, friend of mine and, and myself designed and, and put together a few years ago. Uh, and uh, you know, they really represent kind of what I'm doing in this talk, the, the different parts of our culture and uh, what we do uh, for play and what we do for work. And, and you can see them there. Uh, so, yeah, little stickers up here. They're also available as patches, but I didn't bring any of those. Uh, but, uh, but you can get those online. And I, I'm not selling them, but they're, you know, I think they're still available. Hackerstickers.com puts them out there. So, yeah, feel free to, to grab any of that stuff while I'm talking. So tell a little story about how, how this came up in the first place. Uh, this is, uh, that's me, and that's my friend Nick, and so we used to play in bands together in, in high school, and after high school, well, e even during high school, uh, you know, we, we just couldn't get enough of music, and this was really before I got into computers. I think it was, it was college when I really got into it, and so we used to go out to a blues bar every now and then. They, they'd have an open mic night, it, musicians would just come, you know, there'd be 25 guitarists. Uh, usually zero bass players, a couple drummers, you know, maybe even a keyboard player or two, uh, and, and they just play uh, uh, blues and jazz standards all night long, you know, just sit there and play all night long. So me and Nick would show up, and you know, just to work on our chops, just to have fun, and uh, and and we would sit in, and I loved it because as the bass player, I get to play all night, and the guitar players loved it because nobody had to be saddled with playing bass, you know. That, that, that would be the, uh, God, yeah, I don't want to play. I played bass last time. So, yeah, I thought that was interesting, you know, how much bass players were outnumbered. And, uh, and even today, uh, you know, people in town know that I'm a bass player and I get a call every now and then because, you know, nobody ever has a bass player or, or they're forcing some poor guitar player to play bass. So when I got into InfoSec, you know, I, I, I kind of thought it was interesting. I started noticing all these bass players. And uh, they just they sort of started coming out of the woodwork. And uh, I started noticing it so much, I started making a list. You know, because, again, pattern. You know, I can't ignore patterns like this, you know, especially when, when it's something that uh, challenges what I thought was reality, what I thought was the truth, which was that bass players are, are typically outnumbered 10 to 1 at least by guitar players. So I started making this list. And... Uh, Found a few guitar players, and there's another pattern in here. If if uh, if you notice it, uh, there's a couple things in the slides. I, I've actually got some prizes I'll give out if anybody can can notice what I'm talking about. Um, be lots of opportunities. Uh, found some drummers, and I found some bass players, and I found some more bass players, and I found some more bass players. <laughs> And, you know, it was just, uh, I was just floored. I was, you know, how come I keep running across all these bass players, you know, but nobody else is, is really, and this is just in people's Twitter bios. You know, so back in 2009, my boss at the time, Dave Shackelford, uh, convinced me to, to get involved with the InfoSec community and, and to really put myself out there, kind of, kind of uh, create a brand for myself and, and uh, get to know people, you know, let people get to know me. And, uh, and get into the industry that way. And, um, and so this was really out of people's Twitter bios that I saw this. And more bass players. <laughs> oh, and, and Dave is uh, actually a piano player. So, poor Dave. Uh, I know there's more than that. I, I knew this wasn't the big picture. This was just anecdotal data. This is what I happened to run across. But, uh, but there was certainly a pattern here, so I wanted to, uh, to explore some more. 
so why do I play bass? You know, I, I just, uh, bass always attracted me because of the, the heft of it. Uh, this is a bass I own, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the, uh, you know, the actual bridge here goes through the entire body and weighs, I, I think it's a full kilo. It's a solid piece of aluminum there. Um, or not, no, it's not aluminum. It's, it's solid steel. And, uh, and, I mean, you could kill somebody with that. You know, it's huge. It's massive. And I, I just like that. I like the heft of something uh, like that. I, I like the, the thick strings. Yeah, it never attracted me on an electric guitar. The thin strings, I always felt like I was going to slice my finger open on the, uh, on the high E there. And so, I mean, this is, when I think of bass, this is, you know, it, it's like holding a giant axe. You know, I mean, that's what it feels like to me. I feel like, you know, when I play, I'm the kind of guy when I play Diablo 2, Diablo 3, yeah, I've got the dual wielding uh, barbarian with, with a giant axe in, in each hand just, just chopping away. And that's how I feel when I play bass. That's how that makes me feel. And that guy's, uh, I would hate to see that thing drop, the amount of tension. I think it's eight strings on each neck there. And, oh, we're a little off the screen here. So I started asking people their opinions. Uh, Joseph uh, Scully, he's, he's one of the ones you saw earlier. Uh, <laughs> says good taste. Uh, Eve Adams had some opinions. She's, she's, uh, uh, I love her opinions. Uh, she's always got them. And, um, and hers here are great. <clears throat> and Dave Lewis, also great opinions. Great, great to uh, get his feedback. Easy, we pull it together. We keep the drums on tempo and support the band, is what he's saying there. You know, so, you know, it's fun to get people thinking about uh, the analogy here, you know, how, how, how to tie this to uh, what we do for work, what we're interested in, security. So I knew this was anecdotal. You know, I wanted to really, I, I need an excuse to go out there and, and do some research. Uh, I'm a research junkie. That's what I do for a living now. I'm, a, I'm an industry analyst. It's my job to go out there and look for patterns and do this research. So I, I thought, why not tackle this? You know, it's, it's, it's been years since I've noticed this pattern. It's been digging at the back of my skull, uh, at, the, uh, at the base of my spine, and I uh, really want to want to go out and check this out. So, <clears throat> so at this point, what what do you, what do you think? Is this is this bullshit? You know, does InfoSec play bass? What 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 do I find in here? Is it is it all in my head? What do you think? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Show me the money. <clears throat> okay, so I so I I uh, I looked for some data. I found some data. I've got lots of data. It's time for some data. So I, I don't think it's any secret. You know, we talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, I've, I've I've attended talks like this. It's a constant conversation in security. We we know we're in a bit of a bubble here. Uh, everybody doesn't see things our way. You know, that that's almost. Uh, uh, it's almost legendary, you know, the the, the kind of um, um, uh, standoffishness between uh, InfoSec and IT. You know, InfoSec, <laughs> it's got to be like this. I found a vulnerability. You have to fix it. Uh, you know, so <clears throat> I really wanted to try and get out of this bubble. And really, I found that we have bubbles within bubbles. And so I went out to explore that. And... Right now, this is my visibility on Twitter. When I look at my stream, when I look at my Twitter feed, I'm following 988 people right now. So that's my bubble. That's what I see. I mean, people retweet other people. So, yeah, you know, honestly, I'm seeing a lot more than that. Um, but 988, that's, I get all my info on Twitter through that. And I spend a lot of time on Twitter. You know, it's, it's to the point now where I don't really even check news sites. I don't really even use RSS uh, readers anymore. Yeah, I just go to my Twitter feed, you know, because uh, the, these guys are interested in the same things I are, uh, I am, and you know they've got RSS feeds, so why not just let them do the work for me, bring it to me, and it, it works so far. It, you know, if I fire up Twitter, I can I can stay distracted indefinitely. So, I, I used a lot of methods to to pull out these numbers. Uh, I used some different uh, Twitter analytics sites. I used a number of different ways of searching. Uh, and the numbers really all came up around the same. So, I mean, this is an estimate, but I feel like it's it's pretty good, plus or minus uh, a thousand or, or, or two thousand. There's 
I think there's about 15,000 of us uh, on Twitter. And, it, you know, that includes, you know, the cyber guys, guys that use cyber and have words like cyber in their bios. Uh, that includes, uh, um, you know, people that, are, that don't come to these conferences, that don't go to these sites. You know, I used a number of different keywords, looking at bios, you know, uh, even linking in with, with, uh, with LinkedIn on some of this. So I feel pretty strongly that's the size of the security bubble. So then I was thinking... The next natural thought there is how big is the Twitter bubble compared to, and my bubble, compared to everyone that works in security. So I started looking at other things, uh, like conferences. Like how, how many of us are at Black Hat this week? You know, last, last year was about 9,000 people. And it's probably a little more than that this year from what I'm hearing. Though attendance numbers sometimes do go down. Um, DEF CON 22 was 16,000 people, so larger than, than Black Hat, if you weren't aware of that. And RSA is the biggest one we've got. That's 33,000 people there. And, of course, uh, once you get to RSA, you know, these aren't all security people. These are vendor people. You've got marketing people. You know, there's, there's all of this ancillary, uh, you know, people uh, that, that, that we've got in the security industry. You know, this is the, uh, uh, the enterprise corporate uh, professionalized security industry here, whereas uh, you know obviously there's there's going to be some overlap between DEF CON and, and RSA, but there's going to be a big chunk that's not overlap there. Also, uh, Bug Crowd. If you're not familiar with uh, Bug Bounty Brokers, uh, Bug Crowd puts together a community that does crowdsourced uh, application assessments, and very interesting because pretty much anyone can sign up to be a tester for Bug Crowd. Uh, so it was really interesting to see the community they drew together. And uh, I've been given the impression, you know, talking to a lot of people and talking to, uh, to Casey over there and, and, and Jonathan Cran and a lot of those guys, uh, that they don't all necessarily come from the security community. There's a lot of developers there. Uh, what they're looking at are, are web apps, mobile apps, things like that. Uh, so a developer, you know, I think that, that draws them in more than the traditional pen tester or security researcher crowd. So then we get into the workforce. There's about 65,000 CISSPs. Now, obviously, we know those aren't all security people. There's, you know, people in management that have CISSPs. There's database administrators. And a lot of other people outside the industry get them. Same thing with GX certs, SANS uh, certs. Uh, they, there's actually more of those than the, uh, the CISSPs. There's 70,000. So then I turn to some government statistics. You know, the Department of Labor... Uh, InfoSec analyst stats, uh, and of course that, that is just the U.S., is about 80,000. But, but what about outside the U.S.? You know, we've got some people from outside the U.S. here, you know, so, and, and I, I suspected we probably would, so I didn't want to just throw out the U.S. stats. Uh, globally, LinkedIn, 125,000. And then uh, just looking for cybersecurity in the title gives you a lot more than that. And interestingly, I found certain countries love the word cyber. Uh, India, uh, you know, that it's universal. There's no stigma with the word cyber. So huge numbers there. A follower wonk allows you to uh, do queries on Twitter stats. So you can actually uh, go to follower wonk and, and query people's bios and also the keywords that they put in their profiles. Very interesting to do some, uh, some analysis. Uh, you can use uh, single words, you can combine words, you can do a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, came up with some stats there, and, and, and really there's so many combinations, you know, it, it just didn't look like a good way of, of putting that together. So and it, I actually had to put a minus drum, because apparently drum and bass is very popular with security people, so I, I get a lot of false positives there. So I wasn't really satisfied with so at this point, you know, you might be wondering how accurate my stats are. So I put together a scale to kind of demonstrate that. On a scale from Donald Trump on one end, you know, not a big fan of statistics generally, from what I can tell, to Marissa Tomei, dead on balls accurate on the other end, um, you know, being very accurate. She's dead on balls accurate. If you've ever seen My Cousin Vinny, it's, 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 uh, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it. I find that that dates myself, and uh, uh, that's actually 
more than far enough back to, to alienate uh, a bunch of uh, pen testers in the room. Uh, so I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm, I'm kind of like if you've ever seen Conan O'Brien's Clueless Gamer, you know, where he reviews a game, he has no idea what he's doing. At the end, he comes up with a random scale that makes absolutely no sense. And, uh, but you still generally get a sense of, of whether he liked it or not. <clears throat> so that, that's, that's about how accurate my stats are. So you know, I also wanted to hook this in, you know, especially seeing that B-Sides Las Vegas has a career track now. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of this does matter uh, for, uh, we can hook this in, we can use this, you know, especially people looking for uh, security people. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's a tough problem. You know, the, the, the government's looking for tons of people. You know, just overnight they decided, you know, we need 6,000 people, so let's get the word out. And, uh, and I actually uh, did a job for the National Board of Information Security Examiners which is a mouthful, NBISE, uh, got a grant from the Department of Homeland Security to try and figure out, uh, and, and I, I couldn't get the data into the slide in time for this talk, uh, but, but we did actually sit down and determine what kind of personalities, what kind of skill sets uh, are necessary. And, and we just did two job roles, but two big ones. We did incident responder and pen tester. And so, so we actually uh, went, went down and, and really, we said, uh, if we're going to train people, you know, because there's not 6,000 people to hire. Uh, they, they just don't exist uh, to hire all those people. And we, we actually gathered all that data. You can go online and, and you can find the, the work we did there. So that kind of, kind of drove that. And um, <clears throat> all kinds of headlines about how many people we need. You know, the, the military is, is ridiculous. Uh, Texas is uh, the, the Air Force's cyber command. You know, they, they've got thousands of people. Army's got thousands of people. Uh, Navy, and then, of course, we've got the uh, some of the big uh, consulting uh, groups uh, have tons of people. So, you know, just the idea that we have organizations, even if they're government or, or large consultants, with thousands of security professionals just boggles the mind. Uh, and we still need more. You know, the appetite's still there for more. Um, uh, this guy uh, uh, posts some great stuff. Uh, I, I forget his first name now, Mr. Montenegro. Uh, actually, just a couple days ago, uh, really happy that I found it, uh, has a nice blog post on the, on the shortage of InfoSec professionals and, and goes into a, a, a lot of detail on it. So it's there. I mean, we've got a career track here. You know, what, what more proof do you need than that? And I did a little looking, and <laughs> there are... Lots of jobs, and these, these are all the people here at the career track. You know, so it's, it's just crazy. Mayo Clinic, you know, we've got a healthcare company. Somebody pointed this out earlier today, uh, that, that it's, it's, uh, it's a big first for a healthcare company to be coming to a security conference looking for security people. You know, and that's great. You know, Josh Corman would be very happy about that, I think. You know, other people that are trying to trying to pull other people into the uh, into the know here and, and get them uh, get them going. So ultimately, I decided I need to do a survey. Uh, as I've already mentioned, the, the response was huge. It was awesome. Uh, the largest percentage of the uh, respondents were attackers. Uh, we got a large amount of defenders as well, and uh, a bunch of people that do IR and forensics. And there was there's an amazing mix of, of them. You know, there are people that said there were both attackers and defenders and incident responders and uh, that they also did marketing and sales. Um, interesting that the male-female split is identical to my Twitter male-female split. If you go to analytics.twitter.com, you can see the uh, split. You can see geographic, demographics. Uh, gender, all kinds of different uh, information about the people that follow you on Twitter. And I thought it was interesting that the, the survey results were the same uh, as my Twitter. And I actually used a lot more than just Twitter to get this out. I used LinkedIn. I called people at universities. You know, I, I really tried to go outside that Twitter bubble to get a lot of these statistics. And, and I got tons of wise-ass responses. So I got one robot back on gender. I, I don't even think I had a write-in on that. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how they managed to get that in there. 
I, I use Google Forms. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they didn't use stored cross-site scripting, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did not allow a write-in. Well, maybe I did. I don't know. It, you know, maybe I was trying to be uh, sensitive to uh, you know people that can't fully pick one or, or the other here. That's entirely possible. I can I, I can be sensitive from time to time. So active on social media, 5% uh, actually said that they're not allowed on social media because of what they do. Um, thought that was interesting. Uh, vast majority, 79% are on there. A uh, lot, you know, like their privacy and, and use an alias. Um, more wise asses. I had a typo. I had option number five uh, as an option for are you active on social media? And 10% of the respondents are wise asses and chose option five. Uh, kind of hard to read this, but uh, you know, one of, one of the questions was, how are you connected to InfoSec? And the, the orange bit here, the vast majority uh, were full-time in the industry. Uh, I also gave an option uh, for people to pick whether or not they felt they were overworked, and that, that was 10%. You know, burnout's not the goal of this talk, but why, why not? I, I, I threw that question in there. 3% uh, work part-time, and, uh, and a solid 15% do security a as their hobby, which you know, I was interested to, uh, to see what that percentage was. We did have a few students and, and one person that throws uh, InfoSec parties and conferences. Um, so I, 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 without showing you the data, I cannot express to you how much I got trolled in the survey. You know, and, and, and it, it's great. You know, it, it, it was just, you know, me sitting there with a the spreadsheet laughing my ass off. You know, somebody, somebody seeing me do that for an hour straight, you know, probably pro would probably think I'm, I'm completely insane just staring at, at Excel. But uh, here's some of the responses I got. You know, I was asking people, uh, you know, what martial art do you do? You know, that was one of the questions. I, I, I thought I'd dive into some of, the, some of the hobbies a little bit deeper. Uh, and I, I dove into music and I dove into martial arts a little bit deeper. And uh, yeah, I beat up CISOs in dark alleys for fun was one of the responses. I asked, uh, what do you do in the industry? Space Hitler was a response. Uh, I, I should have seen Hitler coming somewhere in, in some of those responses. I mean, that's just, uh, I should have expected that. I didn't. It was uh, entertaining. So this bit about base. Do we play bass? Are we a bass player, predominantly? Um, if we did, this would be our new mascot. It would be Bootsy Collins. Uh, that, that, I mean, I don't have to explain that, do I? I don't have to explain that. I don't have to justify that either. He's got five pickups. And all five of those pickups go out to different rigs. Each of those different rigs have different... It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he's... he's I mean... I mean, you walk around DEF CON, and, and I mean, you see this. You see the guy with, you know, the hat has lights. It's got a reader board. You can connect to it over your phone. You can play messages on the dude's hat. You, you know, he's, you know, we've got, you know, I really wanted this to be InfoSec. I wanted InfoSec to be a bass player. But, yeah, in my survey, yeah, yeah we, we play guitar. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I've got to be fair, but uh, guitar came out on top. But, and, and this is a big but, the responses, you know, were, were fairly open. And people that said that they played bass, like, hell yeah, I played bass. Like, they, they, all the responses were passionate. It was bass all in caps, you know. And most of my guitar responses were like, uh, I mess around with it a little bit. Yeah, oh, I've got one under the bed. It's got an inch of dust on it. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, guitar's okay. I've got one. I play with it. You know, they, I mean, decidedly less passionate about the fact that they play guitar. Uh, whereas, I mean, these are all my bass responses. They're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, bass. So I think that counts for something. I think we at least get to double that number, right? <clears throat> So 33%, a full third of my respondents played an instrument. And note that this survey didn't say, hey, music lovers, take this survey. It was, you know, just, uh, 
hey, this is a survey for my B, my uh, B sides Las Vegas stock. Uh, 40% of that 30% were multi instrumentalists. I think uh, the most one listed were eight different instruments. Uh, and it was, uh, it was actually rare to have somebody that just played two. Usually if they played more than one, they played at least three or four. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And when I tweeted that I was doing this talk, I actually got six or seven tweets back. I got a bunch of people, DMs, you know, public tweets saying, hey, you know, I, you know, I play bass, but I also play these other three instruments. Or, you know, I play a ton of instruments. And, uh, and all kinds of theories back that, that InfoSec is really a multi-instrumentalist, you know, those of us that, that play instruments. So 40%, you know, not the majority, but still, that's, that's quite a bit. So the top five, you know, the top two aren't surprising, but I thought it was interesting, uh, the ones that followed that up. Violin, drums, and saxophone. So martial arts, you know, it's uh, really there was nothing overwhelming here. Yeah, you know, I was expecting to see some overwhelming taekwondo category. I don't think we we got one taekwondo, you know, or I, I you know, MMA. I thought was going to be overwhelming. Uh, you know, there were three or four karate, but really the diversity. And again, people that did martial arts. I think it was also about 40% did multiple martial arts. You know, they had a whole string of stuff, like I tried this, and I tried this, and I tried this. You know, and in our industry, you know, it's, it's uh, not uncommon to find somebody who's, who's, you know, has a different phone every couple of months. You know, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's, that's a piece of that there. Only 19% of respondents uh, practice martial arts, which was a little bit lower than I thought. But... Um, Again, 144 people, small sample set. Uh, I know tons of bass players and tons of martial artists in InfoSec that didn't take my survey because uh, I would have been able to tell from their responses. <clears throat> so, again, at the beginnings, friends and strangers alike were just, I mean, giving me their phone number, giving, you know, just pouring their heart out in the survey, which I thought was interesting. And I, I got lots of photos, too. Uh, mostly the people that sent me photos were people I knew, so that was, you know... And I was really nervous about asking for photos. You know, especially asking for photos after I'd seen some of the data, you know, and, and the percentage that I got trolled. Uh, I was really, really afraid of, to, and I, I listed an email address. I said, send your photos to this, to this email address. And, uh, and that, that was, uh, I was a bit nervous about that. But not a single one. I, I, there were no goatsies. There was no, not, nothing that scarred me for life. Um, there was, there were several things I didn't expect. Uh, so we've got some martial arts photos. Um, we, we've got a vehicle that cannot be hacked remotely, cannot be disabled. Uh, you can't turn the radio up full on that remotely from the internet. So I'm glad we got a good example of that. Uh, a lot of auto enthusiasts, uh, in InfoSec. Though I, I do find that they tend to be in management at large companies near Silicon Valley. Um, not all of them are, you know, but, but a lot of automotive enthusiasts, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's fun to hack cars also. <clears throat> cars. Uh, we've got some writers. We've got some novelists. Uh, we've got uh, people in the industry that, that, Make video games on the side. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, me. That's my novel. <clears throat> I did not put the Amazon referral link on here. I, 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 I didn't think to do that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> flying, Taking selfies while flying planes. It's okay, though. He was at a stoplight. Uh, and conferences are a hobby. You know, I mean, how many of us at home, I mean, what, what do you do in your lane, with your lanyards when you get home? Now, I've seen lots of pictures of those, you know, the, the cork boards with, you know, just here's all 22 of my DEF CON badges or, you know, just, you know, it's, I, I don't feel like I've been to that many conferences and uh, I can't throw them away either. Each one comes with memories and, uh, and, and I've, I haven't hung them up for display, but I, I've got tons of lanyards and stickers as well, and that—that's a paper shredder. So I, I love the fact that the uh, 
you know, the cons are supporting the, the uh, confidential, confidentiality of documents there. <clears throat> the shredder. Of course, picking locks, I mean, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a given. There's no surprise there. And, and drinking. So, yeah, yeah, again, you know, I was at a crossroads. I could have gone really dark route with this. You know, I could have talked about burnout, mental illness, uh, alcoholism. You know, and maybe that's something I can do more of in, in the future. You know, it's, it's certainly uh, present in our, in our industry. Uh, I think anytime you get a lot of smart people together, uh, artists, you know, hackers, what, whatever we do, uh, you uh, do get a higher percentage of that. It just uh, goes along with it. And I'm sure there's a story to tell there, too. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we all hack in bars wearing balaclavas. <clears throat> That's normal. Does anybody know what this is? There you go. Uh, come up, come up, and get a prize. All right. All right. What? Oh wow. Would you at least label it so there weren't surprises? It was not eating matter. One was this big. It was really cool. Wow. Um, I've, I've got very geeky prizes. Uh, th this is so... Ooh, oh, that's great. Yeah, besides Knoxville, we made some oh, electronic badges. Awesome. Yeah, you can have that one. Thank you. Okay. There you go. One. Thank you. My, my other prizes... <laughs> yeah, give her a hand. My other prizes are, are Super Nintendo, Nintendo cartridges, uh, ones that are based around puzzle solving, stuff like that, so... Um, took a risk there. I wasn't sure how excited people were going to be about that. I'm a big vintage gamer. That's that's one of my hobbies. I, I collect all the old consoles and games, and uh, I actually go to to some conferences and put on uh, vintage gaming exhibits. You know, where I hook them all up and let let people come play them, and and it's uh it's fascinating to watch younger generations, six year olds, seven year olds, try to play Mario on a Nintendo or on a Super Nintendo. Right there on the screen, it says "Press Start to Begin," but they'll, they'll sit there for three minutes jamming button A, you know, just just hitting the button because on all the uh, the new systems, you can just hit any button and it'll start the game for you. But they cannot figure out. I mean, they, 10, 11 years old, old enough to read, cannot figure out. You have to press Start in the center of the uh, controller. It's uh, yeah, I get a little shot in foot from that. Uh, it's uh, it's a little entertaining to watch. But, uh, but I, I do let them know. I want to watch them actually play the game. But yeah, and, and then they die in three seconds, and they're like, "What? That's it? Yeah, you start from the very beginning, dude. There's there's no continue. You got you know you get hit once in contra, you're dead. Anyway, sorry, I digress. So yeah, mycology is 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 creating armies of goombas, um, mushrooms, fungus. I thought that was really interesting, and this guy's really in, into it. Oh no, no, this was an outlier. No, that, well, I mean, shoot, I'd have several slides about that if that was a common hobby. I'd be like, holy crap, I need to research mycology now. What? So, I mean, he says it relaxes him. It's, it's, it takes a lot of patience. You know, it's, uh, I guess it's like farming. You know? So the act of doing it and not eating them. I did not ask what he is growing or for what purpose. I didn't ask. I didn't ask, and I do not recognize the stuff in that jar. But uh, yeah, I thought I thought that was great. So you know, the more and more I looked at hobbies, and I really didn't include a lot of the ones you already know. I mean, I mean, you can see them at DEF CON when you're there. You know, I, I did include lock picking and, and alcohol. You know, we've been told at Derby Con that we drink more than the Kentucky Derby uh, when we're there, and uh, and they're actually kind of worried about us the first couple of years at Derby Con, but they got they got used to it. I guess we don't cause too much trouble. But, you know, I started kind of in my mind categorizing everything we do. And, you know, I thought, you know, it could be kind of cool if we had a tagline. You know, something I could, I could you know, put on a sticker, put on a T-shirt. And I thought, hey, you know, we're, we're kind of a post-dystopian. You know, it's, it's been bandied about a lot. Neo-cyberpunk traveling rent fair. <laughs> and I love it. I, I love the fact that I can say that. You know, without having to really stretch it, 
Uh, you know, I can be fairly honest saying that, I feel like. So yeah, yeah, I want to get stickers and t-shirts made that say I'm I'm part of a post-dystopian neo-cyberpunk traveling rent fair. So conclusions. Uh, I don't think this is a big surprise for us. We, we see the world very differently. Uh, you know, normal people see a car, 80 mile per hour brick of death is what we see. We see challenges and puzzles when people see safety and, and barriers. Um, you know, we, we, we can't check out at a retail store without noticing open USB ports. You know, we, ju we just see things differently. Uh, trash bin, we, we wonder, you know, what's in that trash bin? You know, because we know what people throw away. They throw away expensive stuff, perfectly good stuff, sensitive stuff. Uh, and, you know, again, the pattern matching. You know, when, when people just see noise, we see patterns. So both a gift and a curse. I think that goes back to why sometimes we have a really hard time getting along, getting along with the rest of IT, with, with, with other people, and kind of explaining the way we see things to them. So it's, it's a gift in that we can see the stuff, we can help, we can fix it, we can break it. Uh, but, but also, it's hard not to see it. It's, it's hard to ignore it, or it's, or it's hard to accept that, uh, yeah, you know, I get it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. And, you know, again, the, the responses I got in this survey, you know, really convinced me that, that security is a calling for many of us. I asked people, how did you get into security? And, and none of it was, you know, well, you know, I went to my guidance counselor or my career counselor or, you know, I saw, you know, a post, you know, I saw something about hacking and thought, hey, you know, that would be great. None of it was like that. All of it had a story behind it. It was, it was like, you know, there's this one time, you know, uh, you know, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and saw this guy war, war walking or something like that. I asked him what he was doing or, you know, like a lot of it, people just fell into it by accident and they're like, what? You're doing what? You can do that? You know, and he's like, oh, this is just my hobby. I actually do cooler stuff, you know, full time, you know, and I, and I get paid for it. It just blows people's minds. And that, that was the story behind how a lot of people got into this. You know, they just fell into it. They just happened to meet somebody. Uh, or get introduced to somebody and, and just got sucked in, you know, and, and, and every story was like that. I got sucked in, you know, and I also asked people, you know, what they do in their spare time. You know, I showed some of the hobbies that I thought were more interesting, but a vast number of the responses, you know, people do security at work and then they go home, more security. You know, maybe different stuff, but, uh, but it really is a passion. It's, it's a hobby for a lot of us as well. Uh, a lot of people do say, uh, did say they, they have to decompress with something else, though. So, yeah, some people have been doing it so long they can't remember when it started. That was a very common response. It's, you know, I, you know, it, like stating to me five, six years old, seven years old, you know, I was taking stuff apart or, you know, messing around with my trash 80 or my my Commodore 64, my Amiga, you know, just all these great stories. You know, it's, you know, and you can tell each one. Like, I'd like to talk to a lot of these people and really get the full story. Also got a ton of responses. Uh, well, when I say a ton, let's quantify that. Uh, for me, a ton of people saying, you know, admitting to me and gave me their phone number, you know, that they were doing this illegally. You know, that, that they were, you know, actively black hats or with a lot of them, it was, it, was, it was really just messing around, stuff like that. But, you know, stuff where they could have gotten arrested, could have gotten in, in serious trouble. Um, you know, it was, it was maybe 20, 25 people out of the 144, which was really surprising to me that they were like, yeah, I did a bunch of illegal shit. And then I decided, well, you know, maybe maybe I should make some money at this and not go to jail for it. And, you know, kind of flip the flip the coin there. Uh, do do the uh, do the opposite here, and uh, I guess they had you know some watershed moment where they had that realization that uh, uh, you know they they could fulfill this interest uh, w without uh, uh, breaking the law and, and, and risking their their freedom and stuff. So uh, a lot of people said it's fun, and uh, <laughs> a much smaller percentage. Uh, said so they, they, they do it for more noble purposes. You know, they, they like to think that they're helping uh, the, the industry. 
Uh, but the, you know, still, still a number of responses there. You know, may, maybe 10, 15. Uh, but overwhelmingly, I, I think it's really in order here. Uh, it was an accident. Is by far number one there. You know, it, it's it's a funny story. You know, that that's that's the majority. How I got into security is a funny story. I bet that could be a talk in itself if we if we could collect those stories. I'd love to see them. So that's it. That's um, like I said before, this is something I'd like to do over time. I'd like to gather more data. Um, I'd like to actually, you know, take some of this to psychologists. I, I'd, I'd like to really drill down into it and, and, and see what kind, of, uh, what kind of stuff floats to the surface. I'd like to get these stories and, uh, and talk to people how they got into security. I think, I think that would be really interesting. But I'd like to hear what you'd like to, what you'd like to see, what you think, uh, what direction you think I, I should take this. So if anybody has any questions or anything, go for it. Thank you. So we definitely have time for questions. Um, or we'll come up here to talk to the speaker. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I'm kidding. you're saying. to say. Yeah. Oh, you'll have to use this one. Yeah. Oh, that's OK. I think the big takeaway from this slide and all the hobbies is that we overwhelmingly suffer from ADD. ADD? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, I, it, I it honestly, accounts for the multiple instances, it accounts for the multiple versions of martial arts, it accounts for a lot of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm diagnosed with, uh, with ADHD, and, uh, and I did that recently as part of my research, as you know, I... My, my son has it, was diagnosed with it, and, and we know that it, it does get passed down. So I thought, you know, yeah, I've got all those earmarks too. You know, I started reading books about it, and, and that's part of the other crossroads that I would like to go down, you know. And yeah, I said mental illness, that's the extreme part of it. You know, I think there's some of that too. But I, I, I think a lot of it is, is uh, something that's a little bit more approachable. I, th I think people are less scared of being labeled ADHD than they are Bipolar, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Mental illness or talent. Mental well, you know that that depends on the historian. Right. Mental illness or t or talented. You know, the historian gets to make that call when he writes the textbook. One of the things that you touch upon. <laughs> or artist, we can use that word too. One of the things that you touch upon is that the perception that a lot of folks in information security enjoy is different from the majority of the populace. And that perception is what gives us the, the, the financial value in our industry. You know, being able to see something and generate yeah. information out of something that most people have never seen. Um, and in my opinion, ADD or you know, those groups of symptoms that you often see um, is what allows us to do that. Yeah, because uh, for a lot of people, AD, ADD and ADHD, it's, it's just being distracted. You know, somebody that, that, that can't ever finish anything, they get distracted a lot. But, but one of the earmarks of it is getting hyper-focused into something. and, and almost repeat the question to the audio? Yeah, and, and almost uh, obsessive with it. So... Um, Oh yeah, yeah. That that that's tough to to be able to switch gears, you know, and stop. Like being interviewed for me, uh, it, it, it has been very challenging, you know, because the reporter wants to go on before I'm done saying all the things that I want to say. Uh, so, trying trying to think of how to summarize what you said for the, for the video. Um, basically, uh, my argument is that ADD. No, no, no. Um, so it wasn't really a question, just sort of a, a statement to open a conversation. An observation. An observation. Yeah. Um, my observation is that uh, the, the symptomology of, of ADD um, presents itself in a way that uh, depicts a difference in perception. Um, and that difference in perception is something that most folks in info, InfoSec uh, enjoy. And if they can utilize it to the best of their advantages, then it becomes a career if they do it right. Um, and that difference in perception is has monetary value. That's that's you know why most of us are employed to do what we do. It's also why a lot of people see us as a pain in the ass. That's true because because the level of creativity and the interest is hard to you well, can't train it. Both a gift and a curse. Right. Um, well, uh, so anyway, um, famous people 
might want to look up if you want to look at, at that sort of thing. Yeah, who would have been a hacker? Uh, is, that, is that what you're saying? People that had that same mindset? That so I used to have a list, um, but certain famous people. Uh, let's see, Nikola Tesla. Yeah. Now historically, uh, well, Nikola Tesla and um, who's the other guy? The guy who Nikola Tesla used to work for. Uh, not for yeah, Ed- Edison. Edison. Yeah. So uh, they both had similar habits. One of which was they would have, say, a table or a row of tables with a number of different projects on it. And they would go full bore on one project until they, they grew tired of it or they uh, lost uh, momentum. And they would immediately turn around and go to the next project and jump next to next. To next. Yeah, and I've known people like that. He, he's, say, he's saying basically um, a lot of famous people, people we, you know, we look back at and we see as, as geniuses, uh, you know, would get very hyper focused on one thing, on one project, and, and then jump to the next. You know, maybe Leonardo yeah. da Vinci also, but yeah, Edison, Tesla, um, and have the, multiple projects at the same time. Right. So uh, right. capturing that energy when you get lose that when you start to lose that hyper focus, you've got you, you've got to chase it. Right. Yeah, you've got to chase it when when that the muse when the muse shows herself, you've got to chase it down. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and I definitely. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my projects, I have a list of projects. I probably have 600 uh, projects in anywhere from the idea stage to partial completion to, um, you know, even far beyond where it should have already been a talk or like, like I, I should be done with the project by now. Right. You know, and it's, it's uh, really when, when I have to put it down and I can't finish it, you know, because family or because job or because life happens. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it's difficult to go back to it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's tough to pick that up again. But uh, but yeah, I save everything. I can't throw any of that away. Yeah. All, all those projects are still sitting there waiting for me to pick them up. Sometimes I go back to them and I'm like, oh, well, that's that's uh, big business now. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, a lot of people say that there's there's nothing special about a lot of the people that started these companies and started these projects except for the fact that they they could both have that mad focus and that drive to do it and can execute mm-hmm. you know and, and and can you know not lose focus and, and take it to that next step or you know they, they've got somebody else you know like the jobs to the Wozniak right you know to, to guide them and, and focus them and say yeah no 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 don't stop that keep keep going keep going we're gonna here's be rich do. yeah yeah here, here's another do. surge. Here's another Mountain Dew. Oh, I had search the other day. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll call it good at that. Thanks yeah, so that, much. I think we can call it. Thank you. Oh.